Go. All right, a very good game underway as Nebraska has the lead by a score of 14 to 10. Interestingly, earlier today, we talked with the head coach, Tom Osborne. We talked of special teams. They've led to touchdowns for both clubs. Now, coming up here at halftime, we'll be speaking with the head football coach of the number one rank, Sooners of Oklahoma. Barry Switzer will be live from Norman, Oklahoma. His club took on North Carolina today. All the scores and highlights are on the way. Stay with us as the halftime report kicks off here on ESPN. The CFA College Football Halftime Report is brought to you by Rayovac. We give you the power. Welcome back to our Halftime Report. Tim Brando in the studio. And let's start with number one, Oklahoma. The Sooners of Coach Barry Switzer knocked off North Carolina. Mark Mays, a fine quarterback. They shut him out. 28 to nothing was the final score today in Norman. And we've got number two and number three on the air right now, so why not talk to the head coach of the nation's number one team as we turn and go to Norman, Oklahoma, where Barry Switzer is standing by. Coach, thank you for joining us. Before we talk about your game, I know you know a great deal about Troy Aikman. I know you know a lot about UCLA. You had them a year ago. Let's talk briefly about these two teams as you see them, the way they match up on paper. Well, Tim, I've seen the last seven minutes of this ball game. Our game is just over, and I... Uh... You know, Nebraska, I know so much about. We played UCLA last year, and we were more physical than they were and had more speed than they did, and we, we won the ball game easily in our opener. But Nebraska is a dominant defensive football team, and I think is much stronger and faster than UCLA. But yet, UCLA with Troy Aikman on the old X Sooner is playing pretty well right now. It's a very good football game. Let's talk a bit about your team now. You went up against Mark May today, a fine quarterback for North Carolina. They were without Torin Dorn, their fine running back that had 165 yards. Did that affect them offensively in your mind, Coach? Well, well sure it does. Anytime you lose good players, Tim, it affects your football team. But at the same time, we'd rather play an eye offensive football team than we had an option team. And our defense can run with those people and be more aggressive with that style of offense. Uh, we played good on defense today, but we made 19 penalties today. We were very ragged, and we probably should have played better and moved the ball more and scored more today, but penalties were hard to overcome, first and 20 and first and 15. That happened several times for us today. Jamel Holloway. A lot of people have been talking about the Heisman so far this year, and you know, Jamel is not the first, second, or maybe even sometimes the third guy mentioned, and yet he keeps posting magnificent numbers. He did again for you today. He rushed for 170 yards today, scored four touchdowns, all of our touchdowns, and uh, we had one call back, uh, a halfback scored on a sophomore, but he had a great game. Uh, he plays extremely well. He's only five foot eight, and we call him our midget, but he plays big. He plays tall, and uh, he's a great player. He's uh, probably had over 200 yards total offense today. Coach, uh, a lot is always made every year about schedules and what they mean to a team. You had a bit of a cakewalk last week. You knew that, but it was a home game. North Texas State was someone you were able to put in there. Now, this week, obviously, you took on a better club, but a lot of people think that your schedule is manageable enough again this year with a big eight down a bit outside of perhaps Colorado, who was upset today, and Oklahoma State that may be on a move, that, uh, again, Nebraska is the only game you've got left. What's your answer to that when critics well, come out. First of all, if you'd looked at our schedule two years ago, we were to play Southern Cal, who dropped us for Cal Berkeley, and we were supposed to play SNU, who got the death penalty. So if you had those two in there, you say we play a pretty good schedule along with Texas and North Carolina, and that's what our schedule will be next year. We play SC and North Carolina, Arizona, and Texas. That's as tough a non-conference schedule as anyone can play. Nebraska, now you have to go there again this year, and I know that the Big 8 has changed things a bit, so other teams around the league don't have to go to both Norman and Lincoln in the same year. Now you've got to go to Lincoln two years in a row. How about that? Well, we've probably won as many at Lincoln, Tim, as we have here in Norman. Uh, we've won probably, I think, uh, out of the last nine times played there, we've won six ball games in Lincoln. We've just, uh, it doesn't make any difference where you play in Nebraska. We can play them at Cal Pastor somewhere, and we're going to get ready to play, and I'm sure that's the way they feel about us, too. When you play the big ball games, it makes no difference where you play. So uh, it's always a factor to play at home when you're obviously playing someone you might be a 60-40 better than, but when you match up two great football teams like Nebraska and Oklahoma are, then it really makes no difference where we plan. All right, Barry, thank you for joining us. I know that, that oil is scarce in Oklahoma, but the Sooners haven't changed in the last five or six years. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Tim. 
All right, Barry Switzer, the head coach of number one Oklahoma, who's watching very closely number two Nebraska and number three UCLA. Our score at halftime is 14 to 10. The Cornhuskers with the lead. Scores and highlights of other games throughout the country on the way as the halftime report continues. CFA on ESPN. Welcome back to our Halftime Report. Tim Brando in the studios. Let's get right to them. Nebraska leading UCLA here on ESPN. Special teams a big part of this game. Cornhuskers have the four-point advantage. West Virginia and Ohio State. The Buckeyes who have been to a traditional late starter. Late by, by virtue of the fact that their opening games are usually very difficult. Not so difficult today because of some uh, special teams problems for West Virginia. John Talley has the ball pop loose on the opening kick. That set up a field goal, would make it 3 nothing as the kicker, Pat O'Mara, recovers. Now on their next possession, West Virginia again with the ball. A.B. Brown fumbles. David Brown recovers for the Buckeyes. And you know it's not the kind of day Don Nealon would have wanted coming from uh, Morgantown, West Virginia. That set up this seven-yard run by James Bryant for the touchdown. That made it 10 nothing Ohio State. Still in the first quarter. Beautiful pass here as Tom Tupa drops back. He will loft a pass to the corner of the end zone. 23 yards and a nice catch. A tight rope back there by uh, Everett Ross. And Chris Carter was there to watch. Now a fourth round pick in the supplemental draft to Philadelphia in the fourth quarter. This puts it away. Mike Timko is intercepted by William White. Three interceptions for him. Chris Spielman had a pair as well as Ohio State wins 24-3. Earl Bruce, though, was not happy with his offense, particularly in the second half today. And I don't think we did a good job in the offensive line of coming off the ball and, and dominating the line of scrimmage. They control the line of scrimmage. And that makes it an awful tough day when they do that. Uh, if we want to do that, we're going to have to do some things to, to offset that. We're going to surely have to come off the ball. That's a very slow start for our offense. And this week, we're going to have to improve a lot. So the turnover is obviously a key, but... Uh... They do win it 24 to 3. Notre Dame and Michigan, 26 to 7. The Fighting Irish late in the fourth quarter with a lead. Andrew Zach, a magnificent performance in this game for the Fighting Irish. Jamie Morris, over 100 yard rushings, but a couple of fumbles in the first half that really hurt the Wolverines. Clemson and Virginia Tech, 22 to 10. Clemson, now this was a grudge game for them. They were upset by the Hokies a year ago. Purdue and Washington, and it's uh, Don James's club with a 21-3 lead. That game now in the fourth. Tennessee bombarded Mississippi State 38-10. Reggie Cobb, the freshman sensation for Tennessee, got it done today. Over 200 yards, both rushing and receiving for Johnny Major's club. And Pitt threw a shutout against North Carolina State. 34 to nothing, the final score for Pittsburgh. And they are easily one of the best independents that we have in 1987 early on. Now, the Tulsa and Florida game was an opportunity for Kerwin Bell to get back on track. He had an injured shoulder and all and had to return into the lineup for the Gators today as they tried to rebound from their loss to Miami. Now, the Golden Hurricane, though, looking early for a touchdown and T.J. Rubley is uh, picked off here by Lewis Oliver. He brings it back for the Gators 15 yards. That would set up the Gators offensively for Emmett Smith. And a beautiful run here. Looks a bit like John L. Williams, doesn't he? Neil Anderson, those guys they had a few years ago. He gets into the end zone. That made it 10-0 Florida. It was a route. 66 yards on that run. That made it 24-0 uh, at the half. They went on to bury Tulsa by a final score of 52 to nothing. Kerwin Bell had uh, 147 yards passing in that game, completing 11 passes. On to between the hedges where the Dogs beat Oregon State by a score of 41 to 7 today for Vince Dooley's club. James Jackson, a big game. Kentucky had uh, Joe Worley become their highest uh, scorer in the history of the Bluegrass State's team uh, with a 41 nothing win over Utah State. Elsewhere, Georgia Tech beat the Citadel 51 to 12. Bob Wagner taking over there for Bill Curry, who, of course, has a big chore tonight at Penn State with Alabama. Boston College beat Temple by a score of 28-7 to today. A couple of touchdown receptions for Darren Flutie, the brother of Doug, at the wide receiver spot. Holy Cross beats Army today, 
34 to 24. Now in that game, 62 yards rushing for Gordy Lockbaum. He had seven solo tackles and a total of 102 plays on the field today, both offensively and defensively. Virginia losing to Maryland today, 21 to 19. They had a chance to win it, but failed on a two-point conversion with 10 seconds left, and the Terps get the victory. Now, Syracuse, who upset Maryland last week, beat Rutgers this week. The Orangemen are now 2-0 with that 20-3 win over Rutgers. William & Mary, a long time, they've been a, a class team in Division I AA. Today, they beat a Division I foe, 27-12 over the Navy. On to the Midwest, where Wisconsin fell behind early to Hawaii. Beano Cook picked this one almost, or I should say, selected this one just the way... It turned out Wisconsin with a 28 to 7 win over Hawaii. I think he had 21 to 7 on game day. Northern Iowa and Minnesota are about to get underway. Of course, the Golden Gophers will be without Ricky Foggy, who is suspended for a couple of uh, games for the Golden Gophers. And Indiana beating Rice 35 to 13. Bill Mallory has really done a job in turning that program around. They win today over Rice. Oklahoma State, Thurman Thomas, an outstanding performance for the second consecutive week, over 100 yards rushing for Thurman, 35 to nothing over Houston, spoiling Jack Purdue, uh, Jack Pardee. Southpaw, the sidewinder, increases Nebraska's lead. The second-ranked Cornhuskers up by 11 over third-ranked UCLA, just 13.09 left to go in the third quarter.